We continue our monitoring of situation in Ukraine as regards the Russian invasion. Now, a first shipment of U.S. Bradley fighting vehicles destined for Ukraine have arrived in Bremerhaven in Germany earlier today. According to the U.S. Transportation Command, the shipment of more than 60 Bradleys left North Charleston, South Carolina last week. Apart from Bradleys, armored M88 recovery vehicles, HMM. WV Avenger air defense rocket launches and HMM WV pickups also rolled off the transport ship. The U.S. administration had announced on January 9th that it intended to bolster Kyiv's fight against Russia's invasion by sending Bradley infantry fi fighting vehicles. The delivery came alongside a commitment from Germany to send its own armored vehicles to Ukraine and a similar move by France. The United States, Germany and other NATO allies agreed to send the battle tanks to Ukraine Two Canadian Leopard tanks were the first Western-built battle tanks to arrive in Ukraine <clears throat> excuse me, on Sunday, February 5th. Lithuanian military anti-aircraft guns were also seen loaded into trucks and prepared to be shipped to Ukraine today. Now, on Tuesday, the country's defense ministry said the social, in a social media post it would send dozens of Bullforce L-70 anti-aircraft cannons to Ukraine. The Lithuanian Army spokesperson, Jurgis Novesa, said the guns would help the Ukrainian military destroy aerial threats, including drones as well as crewed aircrafts. Lithuania has also trained Ukrainian soldiers to use the cannons. The L-70, developed in Sweden by Bullforz, is an automatic anti-aircraft cannon that can target and take down targets from a distance of up to five kilometers. Lithuania, the EU, and an, an EU and NATO member pledged to Ukraine a uh, military aid valued of 125 million euros, according to the Defense Ministry. This gun uh, is perfectly used for air defense, especially to fight with UAVs, helicopters, airplanes. Uh, and we believe it will be very useful in nowadays Ukrainian situation, in nowadays war. Uh, and will help to, to protect their people. This equipment is in full working condition. Uh, a week ago, we had a training with Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, we, have, we had a light uh, firing exercise. Also, the Ukrainians uh, were trained how to use this equipment. And why we are doing this, is uh, the answer is very simple. Lithuania is with Ukraine uh, from the beginning of the war, from 2014. A former Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, made a visit to a tank factory in the Siberian city of Omsk on Thursday, saying R Moscow should increase production of tanks in response to Western arms supplies to Ukraine. Uh, speaking uh, to the people there, he said, as we know yesterday, our adversary, uh, Ukrainian leadership, he means here, was abroad begging for planes, missiles, tanks. How should we respond? It's clear that in this case, a natural is for us to increase production of various armaments, including modern tanks. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has been visiting various European countries this week in a bid to secure fighter jets and long-range weapons he says are needed to defend his country against invading Russian forces. Mr. Medvedev, who was perceived as a relative liberal during his presidency from 2008 to 2012, has since positioned himself as one of the most hawkish advocates of Russia's military campaign in Ukraine, often casting the conflict in a political apocalyptic terms in his regular telegram posts. In the meantime, Finland's Prime Minister says her country will not rule anything out when it comes to helping Ukraine following the EU summit attended by President Zelensky himself. And much earlier, Zelensky had said that several European leaders told him at the summit on Thursday they were ready to equip Ukraine with aircraft, including fighter jets. If confirmed, this would be one of the biggest shifts yet in Western support. Responding to a question about sending such aircraft, Sanaa Marin said Finland wanted to send a clear message to Ukraine that it is willing to help in any way possible. Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron said he did not rule out sending fighter jets to Ukraine at some point, but the such aircraft is not a current military priority. Ahead of the summit, European Council President Charles Michel said the EU must provide maximum support for Ukraine during a news conference in which he attended with President Zelensky. While the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte said the Netherlands did not rule out any kind of military support for Ukraine, Zelensky did attend the summit in Brussels as part of a European tour which started on Wednesday when he was in London.
We had uh, group meetings with President Zelensky and, and of course we discussed about uh, arms, uh, about the defense material that they need uh, and that we have to provide. Uh, concrete measures and decisions are made uh, by country base. So, of course, Finland has already made many uh, decisions on uh, providing weapons uh, to Ukraine and we are willing to do more, but these are uh, the decisions made by countries themselves. Uh, today we discussed on general level what kind of um, help Ukraine needs, uh, but I'm sure that, that different countries will decide uh, very concrete measures in the future. I don't want to rule out anything in this stage. I think it's very important that, that we will send that clear uh, message and signal to Ukraine and Ukrainians that we are willing to help any way we can uh, as long as it takes and we must also discuss about more heavy weapons. Security expert David Ota joins me now from our Buja studio. David, thank you for joining us on the program. I'm wondering what your thoughts are. You see here these um, European leaders saying, um, talking about the support that they're providing to Ukraine. Um, President Zelensky was in, you know, the other parts of Europe, soliciting, you know, mm -hmm. more military aid from these European leaders. Um, and then you hear things like, um, th th hear them saying that they would provide all necessary support, but then they're scaling back on what exactly Ukraine needs. I mean, President Zelensky has asked severally for fighter jets, uh, but then you have uh, Lithuanian military sending anti-aircraft guns that they say will be used to target um, to protect the, the air, to provide air defense and so on. Do you really see a commitment here from the European Union uh, as regards Ukraine? Uh, yes, uh, Maraji, you're right. I mean, there has been, as we've seen, uh, the European tour, um, you know, uh, which of course marks almost uh, a year before, or a year, you know, um, you know, during the time when uh, Russia invaded um, Ukraine, you know, on February the 24th, you know, so it's almost like a one-year anniversary time, which is strategically selected, you know, by Vladimir Zelensky. He first went to uh, London, as you rightly said, uh, where the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, um, you know, made that statement about the promise of, you know, um, everything is on the table or nothing is off the table, kind of, um, in a way. And that rhetoric of, of you know, uh, nothing is off the table uh, has been taken on by uh, the following um, visits, you know, which he made uh, to Paris, of course, as you saw with the uh, European Parliament. Um, you know, several members, you know, have made the same statement with the European Union. Um, so uh, this visit to Brussels as well is an indication, um, you know, Maraji, that um, the European states, you know, the Western powers are ready to, to escalate uh, their demands, or sorry, escalate their support. Uh, previously, in the beginning, uh, it was about sanctions, you know, that didn't seem to work. Um, then, you know, we started seeing a lot of um, money being sent to Ukraine and then, of course, um, various, various uh, um, ammunition, um, as we've talked about in, in several uh, occasions. Um, so this is kind of an escalation um, of the um, support. And uh, Vladimir Zelensky comes on board asking for principally two things. He's talking about uh, give us, you know, uh, fighter jets. You know, we need, um, you know, a freedom uh, in the air kind of, you know, to be able to uh, deal with uh, some of the uh, threats that, uh, you know, uh, Ukraine is faced, you know, within uh, the, this, this situation. But remind you, uh, this war is still being fought. Uh, within the Ukrainian territory, despite uh, Russia's claims to um, four other regions, you know, including uh, excluding Crimea. So um, I think the, the, the question here for most of the European states, you know, I mean, the reason why they do not want to say categorically uh, that they will provide these fighter jets is because they are concerned in terms of, you know, how this is going to work from an operational perspective. You know, um, before, of course, you know, they were given a lot of defensive missiles, um, weapons that could be used within Ukraine. But when you start talking about fighter jets, then, you know, there is a risk uh, that, you know, this could escalate uh, the conflict further. So I think, you know, again, you know, the next demand, which, um, you know, uh, Vladimir Zelensky is making, he wants Ukraine to be considered to join uh, the European Union. And he comes with these two heavy demands. You know, we want to join the European Union. We want to protect freedom and unity uh, that, you know, European states do enjoy. Uh, we want to protect the Europe, you know, against um, Russia. And of course, you know, uh, most of the European states 
uh, prepared, you know, to allow Ukraine, you know, to continue to fight the battle uh, against Russia, you know, if that could avoid uh, the European states from confronting Russia directly. But the implication has to be said is that, you know, if these, uh, you know, fighter jets are provided uh, by these European states, then uh, inevitably it might seem, you know, more like to Russia that, you know, this is a direct attack from Europe. And that's why we've seen some Russia retaliations, you know, uh, recently with, um, you know, some of the missiles that they fired uh, in the capital, Kiev. Yes, uh, and it does seem like, you know, um, President Zelensky already sees that this war is going to extend beyond a year. Um, he could be looking at another, uh, at the end of this year, Ukraine could still be fighting this war. And then uh, to your reference, uh, him asking to join the European Union, you, you, do you think that this could also be his way of really forcing the hand of the uh, continental body to really provide that support that he needs? And because then they will be obligated to provide the, the fighter jets that he requires when he becomes a member. And then them pulling back on this and saying, no, this is going to take a long time. We're not providing you with any shortcuts. So it's, it's also them protecting their own territory, knowing uh, that Russia could strike as well. Um, President Vladimir Putin did uh, announce earlier on in the war that any country that supports or provides or interferes in this war would also be getting a bit of the action. Amaranti, we're in a very difficult and very precarious uh, situation as far as this war is concerned. Uh, and, and this is why you, you could hear the European narrative saying, um, you know, uh, no options are left out, you know, some kind. In, in a way, they do not want to implicate themselves directly in terms of, you know, uh, this request or this recent request. Uh, and mind you, you know, uh, the, the president of Ukraine is not just asking for these fighter jets. He continuously um, is asking for other things which are already been provided uh, to some extent. So um, he's asking for more each time. It's almost like the Oliver Twist of this war. Um, because, of course, you know, he understands that, you know, Russia has the capabilities to uh, continue fighting. Uh, the, the Russian government will continuously, uh, you know, produce uh, some of these um, uh, weapons that, you know, of course, have been destroyed, you know, by surface-to-air missiles which have been given to Ukraine. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very precarious, especially for the European Union. They do not want to... Uh, see themselves, you know, with blood in their hands in the sense that, you know, they get involved in, uh, in giving these, um, you know, fighter jets directly to Ukraine. Uh, and then, of course, you know, um, that, you know, uh, annoys Russia and then Russia tends its weapons against Europe. And that's what Europe does not want. Uh, we've gone through the winter of, you know, discontent, I'll call it, you know, because, of course, uh, it has been a very difficult time. Uh, with energy gas, with Russia being accused of weaponizing the war, um, using energy. And now we are approaching, you know, some kind of uh, a spring uh, period where uh, th there is some kind of a reduction in terms of the pressure that Europe used to have, you know, during the, uh, the winter period. So a lot of European states are looking at this and saying, of course, you know, we want this war to go on perhaps further. And the whole idea, uh, Amarachi, is that, you know, they want to weaken Russia. So the more they provide, you know, these resources to uh, the Ukrainian government uh, to continue fighting, then, of course, um, uh, Russia will become more weak. But, the, I mean, the, uh, for me, the fear is that, you know, if, if Europe is ready to provide fighter jets, then the last demand or request that will come from, you know, President Zelensky is that, you know, the West should provide boots on ground. And once yeah. that happens, then, you know, we are facing some sort of a, a Ted War if we're not already facing that at the moment. The former president of Russia, Dmitry Medvedev, uh, was in a tank factory and he made reference to, you know, all of these military supplies that are coming into Ukraine and saying that Russia also needs to build up. And then we also saw the missile strikes in Russia today, in Ukraine today, hitting almost every region in the country. Is this the major offensive that Ukraine has been expecting or is there more ahead? Uh, we can never tell. Um, you know, we've seen um, Russia increase, increase its, uh, um, you know, its, uh, its attack on, on Ukraine as, as time unfolds. And, and the more that Russia realizes that the European states are providing, um, you know, uh, more weapons uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and, and this is why, you know, these, um, you know, uh, missiles that we've seen being struck upon uh, Kiev on critical infrastructures, um, has been as a result of this um, trip uh, that um, Vladimir Zelensky makes to Europe, asking for more support. Uh, and the fact that the European states are saying, we will consider it. 
uh, even though they haven't been very clear as to if they will actually do it. Uh, because, of course, it does require some level of understanding and agreement in terms of how these um, fighter jets will be used, you know, and I, I think what, you know, the West doesn't want to see as well, uh, um, Marachi, is that they do not want to see uh, a situation where their fighter jets that they're supplying to Ukraine uh, are being gone down by Russia. Um, then it becomes, you know, some kind of a, a demoralization. And, you know, the, the population in the West, you know, does not have the hunger. Uh, for any other war or confrontation of that nature. So I think what we're seeing here is um, the West, you know, gradually uh, dragging Russia in. And, and the problem with Russia is that, you know, having occupied these territories in, in Ukraine, they have to find a way to maintain it, to control it. And this is where the long war, the war of attrition comes in. They will suffer the more. More Russian soldiers will uh, perish, you know, during this period of trying to consolidate their, you know, their powers in Ukraine. And this is what the West wants, you know, but they have been very, very careful not to cross kind of what I call the double red line, and which is, you know, to directly see themselves involved, um, you know, confrontationally with um, uh, the Russian force, which of course is quite heavy. David, also always a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you for sharing your analysis with us. Thank you.